So hi everyone, thank you for coming. So I'm Marco and uh, today I'm happy to introduce you Professor Guido Beofetta from Italy. So Guido is a, a full professor in, at the University of Turin in Italy and uh, he is a professor in theoretical physics. He works uh, in fluid dynamics, mostly in turbulence, mixing and turbulent convection. And uh, he's a fellow of uh, Euromec, the European Mechanics Society and uh, uh, an associate editor of Physical Review Fluids, published by ATS. And today, he will speak about the time irreversibility of fully developed turbulence. Okay, does it work? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. And thank you for coming. And thanks to the TSVP program for the opportunity to visit uh, OIST. It's very nice and, and enjoy it. So today we speak about uh, uh, time irreversibility in fully developed turbulence, and the talk will be rather general, I hope. So I will start with an introduction to turbulence. So many of you maybe already know everything about that. And then in the second part, we discuss more specifically about irreversibility in turbulence. So uh, <clears throat> let me start from a sentence taken by this nice review by Falkovich Srinivasan some years ago that essentially state that turbulence is intrinsically, intrinsically time irreversible, in the sense that if you look, watch the movie of turbulence in steady condition running backwards in time, you should be able to tell, to understand there is something wrong, okay? In stationary condition, because in non-stationary condition is trivial, but in stationary condition is not trivial, and we will see. So let me start with a movie, which is not taken by turbulence. Okay, this is a, a scene from a top secret, it's an action comedy from the, I think from the 80s. It's very, very stupid, but very nice movie. So if you want to watch it, and this is the famous scene in the, in the bookstore. And you start seeing there is something strange in this scene, but this is, okay, it's old time movie. So it's uh, no, no computer graphics here. Everything is real. And so there is, uh, okay, a little bit slow. There is some turbulence also. So it's related to my talk. Okay, here you see turbulence and you start understanding there is something strange. And then it's okay, almost finished. And then at the end, you, you understand what is going on. Uh, look at the dog there. Okay. And so the dog comes. So the point is that the movie was shooted backwards in time. Okay. Or this thing, and then reverse. And then you understand that is something wrong. So, more seriously, <clears throat> we are considering turbulence, and turbulence is described by the Navier Stokes equation. And we in the limit of uh, uh, zero viscosity, so this is the kinematic viscosity, which is typically a small number in dimensional number, in small, small quantity dimensional number. But in the limit of zero viscosity, we have the, the Euler equation, which describes the, the motion of the ideal fluid. And the, the, Navistok, the Euler equation, sorry, is, uh, is invariant for time reversal. So if T goes in minus T and U in minus U, you have the all the term here doesn't change, doesn't change sign, so you have exactly the same equation. So it's invariant under the time reversal, and because p essentially is proportional to uh, u square, and also the Euler equation conserves the energy, the kinetic total kinetic energy, which is nothing but the average of the velocity square, is preserved by this equation. Okay. Now, if you consider a real fluid, which is described by the Navier-Stokes equation. You have an additional term, which is a dissipative term given by the viscosity of the Laplacian of U, and this breaks time reversibility because if you change, if you make time, uh, time reversal symmetry, this quantity change sign, this guy change sign, so you break time reversibility. And also, <clears throat> the energy is not conserved anymore because viscosity is dissipative, and you have that the kinetic energy is dissipated at the rate which is proportional to nu times zeta. Zeta is what is called the entropy which is nothing but the average of the vorticity square. Remember, the vorticity is the curl of the velocity. In any case, energy is dissipated. And the, the rate of energy dissipation is called typically epsilon, is the a key quantity in fully developed turbulence. So there is a fundamental law, empirical law in turbulence, which is called the, essentially the dissipative, anom dissipative anomaly. And this state that uh, the limit of uh, uh, of Navier-Stokes equation for vanishing viscosity is singular, in the sense that if you let the viscosity go into zero, you do not recover the Euler equation, in the sense that the energy is not conserved. 
Okay, so the limit of the, the dissipative term for nu goes to zero is equal to the energy dissipation rate, which is a constant. This is an empirical law observed in experiment and simulation. These are a summary of several simulation, numerical simulation, which plot the energy dissipation rate, it may dimensionless, this is not important, as a function of the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is essentially the inverse of viscosity. So viscosity going to zero is equivalent to have a larger Reynolds number. And you see that it starts to decrease, but then you reach a constant plateau. So it means there is a, a singular, what mathematicians call a singular limit in the sense the limit in nu going to zero is not equivalent to nu equal zero, okay? There is this dissipative anomaly. And the physical reason is very simple at the end. The point is that as the viscosity becomes smaller, the velocity develops stronger gradients. And this quantity here essentially compensate the vanishing, the vanishing Yes, let me finish the vanishing viscosity, and so you reach a finite constant limit. Yes. Hi, Guido. This is Mahesh. Uh, I don't buy you. that statement of Srinivas. Can you hear me now? We don't hear you. That's odd. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh. Maybe we can. Should I do? Okay, sure. No problem. Okay, maybe later I can answer the question. So uh, I was saying that the, the, the reason for this, uh, for this anomaly is that uh, the velocity field develops stronger gradients that compensate the vanishing viscosity, so the limit is finite. Okay, so the basis of this empirical fact. There is the Kolmogorov developed the, the theory of turbulence in the 40s. Now, there is a very brief history of the story of the theory of turbulence. It starts with G.I. Taylor, that was the first probably to realize that turbulence has been considered as a random field. And that, uh, so we need a statistical description, but single point statistics is not sufficient. We have to take into account at least correlator between two, two points velocity correlator or structure function, we will see. Okay, and then the, the, the important contribution was given by Kolmogorov 10 years later, more or less, where he developed the similarity theory of turbulence and he derived the four fifth law that I will describe in the following for, for the, the turbulent flow and has a fundamental prediction for the energy spectrum, which has this fighter slope, which is what is called now the Kolmogorov spectrum. So the idea of Kolmogorov is that the Navier-Stokes equation is not only invariant for the reversal, but also is invariant for scaling transformation. So it means that if you rescale the space by a factor lambda, lambda is a positive number, so rescale, you rescale the space. And you rescale also the velocity by another factor, which can be, is another number, we call lambda to the h, okay, by another, another number. And so you have to rescale also time consistently, so time is rescaled as lambda to the one minus h, because it's, it's a, a scale over velocity, okay? <clears throat> And, uh, and you put the scaling transformation in the equation, the, the viscous term fix the value h equal one, minus one, sorry, and you get exactly the same equation. And this is well known, it's called the similarity transformation, and people use this similarity transformation to make experiment in scale of a turbulent flow. For example, you want to study the flow behind a, a, a car, you can put a model of a, a, a car scaled by a factor lambda, the velocity rescale, and on your model in the lab, you have exactly the same flow that you have in reality, because the equation is the same, it's just with scale, okay? So this is the classical idea, it's not the idea of Kolmogorov, it is one. The, the idea of Kolmogorov is that when viscosity becomes small, so the high Reynolds number, in some sense, we can expect the scaling transformation is not fixed anymore because this guy doesn't play any role. And so the idea of Kolmogorov is that we have a scaling invariance in the equation, 
valid for any scaling exponent. So the scaling exponent now is three. And we have to fix the value of h in some way. So how to fix h? And the way to fix h was derived by Kolmogorov with the Fortis law. And the Fortis law, this is a little bit technical. If you, if you know, you already know what I'm saying. If you don't know, don't, don't worry. I mean, just the, 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 the result, the final result is important. But the Fortis law is very important because it's probably one of the few, for sure, is one of the few exact and non-trivial results that you can derive from the navier stokes equation. And, and starting from the, from the equation of motion, now there is an additional term, which is forcing, which is needed in order to have a stationary condition. So you write a two-point correlator. For the equation, you take the average, and you introduce the, the observable, which are very important, the velocity increments, delta L of U, represent the, the velocity differences between two points at the distance L. So in stationary condition, using isotropy, homogeneity, compressibility, you, you end with this expression, okay, where SP represents the moment of order P, the average of the, the velocity difference to the power P, which are called the structure function of order P. And so here are three different, sorry, three velocity increments, so it's three, S3. This is S2 with the viscosity is uh, S2, and this is cut for the forcing term, okay? I rewrite this equation in this, con in this way, and we are in stationary conditions for the time derivative uh, disappear. Guido, sorry, can I ask a question from sure. the chat? Sure, yeah. So this is from Mahesh Bandi. Ah, okay, hi, Mahesh. He says, I don't buy the Falkovich and Srinivasan statement. I've stared at turbulence videos for hours over years, and I can't tell forward from backward. The statement of time irreversibility can only hold on average, isn't it? Time reversal symmetry is almost but never completely restored. We have strong backscatter, so only an average could possibly make sense. Then where is my understanding wrong? Okay, maybe let me go on with the, the, the discussion of time reversibility, and maybe I will try to answer to the question. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, the idea of Kolmogorov is that uh, if you have a scale separation between the scale at which the forcing is pumping energy in the system, so this term, and the dissipative scale, which is the scale at which viscosity removes energy from the system, you have an intermediate scale, range of scale, which is called the inertial range, in which the first term you can show saturate to a constant, which is the energy input, which in stationary condition is equal to the energy dissipation. So I use the same epsilon for the two. And in inertial range, so this term converge to epsilon, to a constant. This term is negligible because a large scale is negligible, a scale larger than the dissipative scale is negligible. And so the, this, this equation becomes simply this, what is called the fourth fifth law. The, the, the third order structure function is equal to a constant, which is minus four over five epsilon, which is the key quantity, the flux of energy times L. Okay, so it means that there is a, a flux of energy from large scale to small scale. And this is again a signature, this is already a signature of irreversibility because of this sign means that you have a flux from large to small scale. For example, in two dimensional turbulence with the flux is from small scale to large scale, the fourth fifth law is similar. You have a different coefficient, but the, the sign is plus because the, the flux is reversed. Okay, so already the fourth fifth law indicates the breakdown in time and reversibility in inertial range. <clears throat> the fourth fifth law is, a, is, a, is a verified in, in simulation and experiment. These are experimental data pretty old by the tabling group. So what I plot here is the, the third order structure function compensated with epsilon L so the minus, so the prediction is 0.8, 4 over 5. And you see that a large Reynolds number, you have an intermediate plateau of scale, which corresponds to the inertial range in which you reach this plateau. Okay, so this is a verification of the fourth fifth law. So now we have a way to fix the scaling exponent. Remember, we have a global scale invariance with an exponent h, which has to be determined. And now, thanks to the fourth fifth law, we can fix the exponent because if the third order structure function has a scaling exponent L, so to the one, it means that the scaling exponent is one third. So the velocity increment scale as L to the power one third. It is the similar theory of Kolmogorov that predicts that the structure function of order P is a scaling exponent P over three. The, di the dimensionless coefficient we don't know apart the case for, for fifth, uh, for the C3. 
And by Fourier transform, you can, you can predict uh, the energy spectrum as a scaling exponent phi curves, which is the Kolmogorov spectrum. And these are some examples of the Kolmogorov spectrum observed in laboratory experiment uh, two different, with two different uh, fluids. It's a gas, it's a water, different scale. This is stratospheric wind, so completely different flow. But in all the case, you see an intermediate scale, you see the Kolmogorov spectrum, okay? Just because you have the same equation behind this phenomenon. Okay, so this, there is a universality in this sense. Okay, of course, this is not the end of the story. Otherwise, I won't give this, I won't give this talk because if you look more carefully to data, I already Komogorov did that, you can, uh, you can observe there is a breakdown of cell similarity. The simplest way to, to look at that probably is looking at the probability distribution of the velocity increment. So what I plot here are experimental data of the PDF so probability density function of velocity increments between two points at different separation. And they are shifted just for clarity, okay? So the lowest one is for large separation, and this is very close to a Gaussian. To a Gaussian means that the two points are completely uncorrelated, as well by Gaussian fluctuation. But if you go to smaller scale, you see that the PDF change the, the shape. The shape of the PDF change, and so it means that you have uh, you don't have a cell similarity in, the, in your flow. And so it means that a single scaling exponent cannot describe the statistics, the statistical profit of turbulence. And indeed, if you compute, uh, remember the prediction by Kolmogorov is that the, the P order structure function is scaling exponent P over three. But if you compute the structure of functions, this is again experimental data in the lab. So this is a structure of function of order two. So sorry, here N is, is P, but it's the same order two, four, and six. And the blue line represents the Kolmogorov prediction. You see that order two more or less works, but of course it's, there are strong deviation for order four and order six, okay? And so if you fit this line with the power law, this touch of function with the power law, you get the set of scaling exponent, which is represented here. These are the scaling exponent for the velocity increments as a function of P. The dashed line is the Kolmogorov prediction and the red point are the experimental data. Okay, so there are strong deviation from the Kolmogorov prediction due to the breakdown of cell similarity. And uh, there are no, so far there are no theories that can predict the scaling exponent. If you want, this is the problem of turbulence, fully developed turbulence. One of the, the biggest problem probably is to, to, to determine this exponent starting from the navier stokes equation, okay? As we as Komogorov did for S3, uh, for zeta 3, which is equal to one, but for the other, there is no way to derive them for the Navier Stokes. But there are some models that can describe this scaling exponent. The probably the most famous model is the multifractal model, which was proposed by Giorgio Parisi and Uriel Frisch many years ago. And the idea is to replace the global scaling invariance of Kolmogorov with exponent one third with a local scaling invariance in which you have a set of exponents, and each exponent is realized in a different set in the space with a given probability. And the probability is a scaling function which, are, which for, for historical reason, is expressed in terms of the fractal dimension. Okay, D of H represents the fractal dimension of the set on which you observe the given scaling exponent. And then at this point, you can compute uh, the average given the probability, but D of H you don't know. You, have to, you need a model for D of H, but given this, this probability, you can compute the structure function, which are the moment of order P of the velocity increments, because the velocity increments are scaling exponent H. So the moment P is P H with the probability you add with expression, this expression, which in the limit of small r, you can estimate with a uh, steep and descent. And so you have an expression for the scaling exponent zeta P, in terms of Legendre transform of D of H. Okay, of course, this is not a theory because we don't know what is D of H, okay? But what is very important, what has been very important for the multifractal model in the past is that it is a consistent method to take into account intermittency and to compute different quantities. For example, you can, you can compute D of H by inverting the Legendre transform. So you measure in the lab, in the experiment, you measure the zeta P. You invert this expression, you get D of H, and now that you know D of H, you can make prediction for other quantity. And this is how the multifractal model is used for, to make prediction. So one of such prediction, which will be useful for the second part, is about the statistics of the acceleration. 
So now we are considering, we are switching from the Eulerian global flow to local Lagrangian trace. So we are considering now a, a single particle, a particle which is transported by the turbulent flow, which is a very simple model, for example, for dispersion in the atmosphere of pollutants of, uh, or a dispersion of uh, phytoplankton cell in the ocean, okay? It's transported by the velocity. And it is well known that the particles transported by velocity, which are called Lagrangian particles, uh, they, they display extreme uh, intermittent, they display an acceleration which is extremely intermittent. What does it mean? It means that if you compute the acceleration along the trajectory of the particle and you plot the PDF, these are data, experimental data from the laboratory of Boden Schatz many years ago. You see that uh, this is the distribution for different Reynolds number, and it's very far from a Gaussian. Okay, the Gaussian is this dashed line. This is compensated with the RMS value. So this will be the Gaussian. And you know that the Gaussian at 3 sigma, you have zero probability to observe something larger than 3 sigma. While in this case, you can observe with a finite probability fluctuation which are 20 or 30 sigma. So extreme fluctuation in the acceleration. And in numerical simulation that we did also some many years ago now. Uh, also in the simulation, we observe for the acceleration the same similar shape, and we are able to observe phenomena, to observe acceleration with our 60 or even 70 times, 70 sigma, the average acceleration, okay? And it is possible to predict the shape of this acceleration in terms of the multifractal model. Okay, again, the details are not important, but essentially you express the acceleration as the, is the time derivative of the velocity. So it's the velocity increment at this Kolmogorov scale, which is the smallest scale of active scale in turbulence divided by Kolmogorov time. And you re re rewrite in terms of the Reynolds number of the flow. So this depends, the shape depends on the Reynolds number, it's not universal. And then using the multifractal machinery, you end with an expression for the PDF, which is very complicated. But the, point, the key point here is that there are no free parameters. The only parameter is D of H, but D of H you know from the experimental data on the structure of function. So you can put the D of H, you can integrate this numerically, for example, and you get this uh, blue line that you probably can see here, which is not a fit, but it's the prediction of the multifractal model that works very, very well up to 60, 70 sigma, okay? So the multifractal model is used as a model to derive, to describe a new statistics starting from the velocity structure function. But uh, I would also like to understand what is the origin of these extreme statistics that we are serving Lagrangian, in Lagrangian <coughs> trajectories. So this is uh, an old movie from a simulation. So the different points represent different uh, uh, particles transported by a turbulent flow. And so you see they, they okay, it's horrible, I'm sorry for that but they generate the trajectories, which is a kind of spaghetti diagram, very, very confusing. But uh, all this trajectory contains all the statistics where we see in this red line, not the statistic of deceleration. Now, I want to detect what, what contributes at the level of particle to the extreme events. So I select among all the trajectory, the one that contributes to the extreme tails in the PDF. Uh, you end with very few trajectories, but you can see probably that all the trajectory has a common feature that at a certain point, the particle is trapped, it's very clear here or here, is trapped in a, in a small scale vortices where it starts to rotate very fast. Okay, the rotation time is of order of the Kolmogorov time and they re remain trapped for a long time because both the vortex and the particle are transported by the flow. And this fast rotation give the stream acceleration that the particle observes. Okay, so this is the physical origin of this extreme acceleration. So now, <clears throat> the point that I want to discuss in the following about irreversibility is how we can detect irreversibility along a single trajectory. Okay, now consider that you, you have a trajectory of the random particle, you, run, you can run forward in time or backward, I don't know which is one, which is which, forward or, or backward in time, and we want to detect if it's possible to have a signature of irreversibility at the level of a single particle trajectory. Okay, so this is the start, the second part of my talk. <clears throat> so it is possible to detect irreversibility uh, at the level of two particles. This is somehow trivial uh, because if you consider two particles 
at the separation r with two different velocity. From the four-fifth law, you can derive, this is a, the Lagrangian equivalent of the four-fifth law, you can derive this expression. The time derivative of the velocity difference square is equal to minus four epsilon. Okay, this is just the Lagrangian version of four-fifth law. And so it has an important consequence, which is very interesting, that now, if you consider how the, par how the particles separate in time, starting from the initial separation r, for short time, you can make a, a Taylor expansion, essentially, so r square of t, is the initial separation, then the, the, the times of or the term of order t for symmetry disappears. So the first term you have is t squared, okay, which is trivial, it's just ballistic. And then at the order t cube, you have this term, which is not in that, but this one. No? If you take the time derivative, you have an acceleration times a velocity. So delta b, delta a. And so you have that for short time, the separation between two particles as a constant term. A quadratic term and a cubic term, which is minus two epsilon t cube. And so this means that uh, you have an, a signature of the symmetry because t in minus t, this, this, this number, this, this term change sign. No? For example, if you compute this, the, the, the separation backward in times minus the separation forward in times, so these two terms cancel because they are uh, even in, in t. And so you have at the end a positive number for epsilon t cube. And so this is means that there is an asymmetric relative dispersion between two particles forward and backward in time. In particular, backward in time dispersion is faster than forward in time. So if you have two particles in the turbulent flow, the time they separate, how they separate backward in time is faster than when they separate forward in time. So this is a signature of irreversibility, but at a level of two particles. We, as I said before, we want to see if it is possible to detect the irreversibility at, this, at the level of a single particle. Okay, so I go back to the, to the, the first uh, statement of uh, Falkovich and Srinivasan. So here are a movie of uh, turbulence. It's a numerical simulation. Each particle is a Lagrangian particle, and the camera is placed on one of these Lagrangian particles moving with the flow, moving with the flow. And as you can imagine, one of the, the movies is forward in time and the other is backward in time. So we should be able to, to detect which is which, but of course it's difficult to do it. Okay, you cannot. I, I don't even know which is which. I don't remember. Okay. So we, have, so we need some statistical uh, analysis for this. So the simplest idea is to look at the velocity difference along the trajectory, but this by definition cannot detect time reversibility. Because if you look at the velocity along the particle, and you compute Vt minus V0, for time reversal, T goes in minus T, but V goes in minus T, V, so you get exactly the same. So this is, by definition, is invariant. But this is not true, for example, if you consider, for example, the V square, because V square doesn't change sign under time reversal, and so the energy increment. So the energy is velocity square. Now you remember the energy increment in principle are not time reversible. And so is a natural candidate to detect irreversibility along the trajectory. And indeed, if you compute the energy increments along a single Lagrangian trajectory, you see that the statistics is not symmetric. So this is the probability density function of the energy increments for different lag tau, okay? Uh, you don't see their symmetry from this plot. Okay, they're almost symmetric, but they are, there is a little asymmetry that you can compute. The average is zero because they are in stationary conditions. So the average is zero. So you can compute, for example, the third moment, W to the power three, and this is not zero. It's negative, okay? And increase, a short time increase like T cube, but this is for some simple reason, but for intermediate time, which correspond to the inertial range in the physical space, uh, you have a plateau, and the plateau change with the Reynolds number. So it means there is, there is an asymmetry of the increment of the energy along the particle. And what is the origin of this asymmetry? <clears throat> Again, it's very simple to understand once you, you see that. I mean, the beginning was not so easy, but uh, for example, let me consider if this is a particle, a trajectory of a particle, this is a real particle in the experiment in, the, in Cornell. And uh, this is the history of the energy along this particle, or if this is the, the important quantity. And you see there is this pattern that we observe several times in the data set, this typical pattern 
in which the energy in the particles start to grow. It takes some time to grow. Okay, about here is about four a little four chromosome of time, and then increase much faster. And this breaks the symmetry between t and minus t. The particle takes more time to accelerate than to decelerate, what we call the fly crash event. Okay. And the fly crash event is the signature of irreversibility at the level of Lagrangian particle. And I want to mention also this has been observed in several other systems, like for example in traffic flow, okay, but also in stock market, for example, people know that in stock market is you you lose money much faster than the time it takes you to gain money. Okay, there is this typical asymmetry for completely different reason, but is is a kind of universal law. Okay, so. In order to have more uh, look more in detail, let me now consider the limit of very small time differences. So I take the derivative of the energy, which is essentially the power, no derivative of energy. Uh, so with the statistic of the power along a particle is not symmetric. So this this is the PDF, the, the probability density function of the power of a particle. And what I plot with a continuous line is the positive side of the PDF and the negative. Is, is plotted as a decimal line. You see they are very similar, but they are not the same. The negative is larger than the positive, so it means that the, the, the third moment is negative. And indeed, this is the third moment as it grows with the Reynolds number. So we have that the probability, the sorry, the, the, the statistics of the power is skewed, and the skewness goes with the Reynolds number. Okay, and we have that the third moment grows more or less like Reynolds to the power two. And the second moment, like Reynolds to the power four third. But these numbers are not a simple dimensional, dimensional number. So if they have exactly the same, this is skinning exponent, the skewness is constant. Okay, it's not growing the skewness, but the third moment is growing. So these, these numbers are very simple, but they are just a fit of, of the data, and they are not dimensional, dimensional number because you can make a very simple dimensional prediction, like Kolmogorov. <clears throat> and the idea is that the power is the velocity time and acceleration. The acceleration, again, is the velocity at the Commodore velo velo velocity over the Commodore time. And so it's proportional to R Reynolds to one half. And so the Commodore prediction will be that the third moment has a scaling exponent three over two, and the second moment Reynolds to the power one. And there are the dotted line which do not fit the data. Okay. So they are not mean field. Uh, uh, exponent, this is exponent two and uh, four thirds, because they are due to the anomalous scaling due to the flight crash event, which are extremely intermittent event. And so we can try to do, is it possible to predict this exponent using the multifractal model? <coughs> so to do that, we first need to, to, to translate the, the multifractal model in the Grangian framework. It is as been done many years ago, starting from Borgas. Uh, I don't want to enter into the details, but the idea is that the velocity increment within two part, a single particle at time t is as the scale, same scaling exponent of the velocity increment at the distance r, which corresponds to editor over time tau. Okay, and so starting from that, you can make a prediction for the statistics of the power, okay, which at the end, as a, you can predict the scaling exponent alpha as a function of the Reynolds number. And you have this expression, which is a little bit complicated, but again, there is no free parameter here because D of H is given from the Eulerian statistic, okay? And this is remarkable because remember that the multifractal model is a kind of generalization of Kolmogorov dimensional argument. It's a refined dimensional argument, which has no information about asymmetry or sign in the statistics. So it's, it's not clear if it can describe exactly the symmetry that we observe in the data. But it did, it works, okay, because these are different data. These are more, more recent data that we obtain. So we have simulation of different Reynolds number. And so <clears throat> this is the, the, the power, this kid, sorry, this is the power uh, to the power three, the third power of the, of the power, and uh, are the, the point, the blue and the, and the yellow point. And the prediction of the multifractal model is, Two is very close to two. Remember that fit was two, the prediction is 2.1, but the prediction is perfectly compatible with the error bar in the data. And for the second moment, the prediction is also a little bit smaller than the, the, the fit is not one, four third, but it's 1.2 more or less, 1.17, but it's still compatible with the data. 
Okay, so this is okay. I think I can skip this one because a little bit doesn't add anything. But I want to discuss a little bit what are the main contribution to the power in order to do the symmetry of the power in order to understand the relation between the viscosity, so the reversibility of the Navier-Stokes equation and the reversibility of Lagrangian trace. So uh, the power is essentially the velocity times the acceleration and acceleration, you can use the Navier-Stokes equation, you can write acceleration as three terms, this is the pressure gradient term, the viscous term and the forcing term. Okay, so uh, for numerical simulation, you have all the statistics, so you can disentangle from the statistics of, of the power, you can extract the contribution of the different, the three different terms, and this is the result. So the, the blue line represents the, the probability density function of the power, which we already seen, and the green line, which is exactly, almost exactly the same point is the contribution for the first term, the pressure gradient term. The black line is the contribution from the viscous term, which is strongly skewed, okay, because dissipation mostly um, reduces the power, but sometimes it gives some power to the particle locally. In average, no, but locally it can do. And the, the, finally, the, the red the red line is the contribution from the force. So, so from this line, you see the, the most of the contribution to the power comes from the pressure gradient term. But what is remarkable is that the pressure gradient term is not skewed, it's almost symmetric. Or even if the, or, uh, the skewness, there is some skewness is the opposite way, is positive. So it's dominant in the statistic of the power, but it's not dominant in the statistics of the, the, the odd moment, in the third moment. And what is important, the, the, we have found numerically the dominant term in the, in the third moment of the power, so the skewness of the power is a, is a complicated term. It's a cross correlation between the pressure gradient and the viscous or the forcing term. So, but the point now is that there is not a, a simple link between the viscosity and the irreversibility. So the viscous term, which is skewed, is not dominant in the statistics of power. So it cannot be responsible for the symmetry that we observe in the power. And so at this point, we can ask another question. Is it real necessary to have a dissipative time irreversible system to generate irreversible trajectories? Okay, so we have seen at the beginning that the viscosity is what breaks the time reversal in the Navier-Stokes equation. And we have seen the Lagrangian trajectory are, have, are um, time irreversible. The power in the Lagrangian trajectory are time irreversible. So one can ask, if I, is the Lagrangian reversibility related to the symmetry break of Navier-Stokes equation or to the dynamics or the dissipative dynamics in the, in the, in, of the Navier-Stokes equation? So another question, is it possible to have, a, to have irreversibility in, in the Lagrangian sense, starting with a time reversible dynamics? Okay, a very common example of that is thermodynamics. No, thermodynamics, if you use a statistical mechanics, you have a perfect uh, microscopic dynamics, which is time reversible, but the microscopic quantity are time irreversible. No? So the idea is to use a time reversible Navier-Stokes equation. There are some proposals to, to, to change the Navier-Stokes equation. What you have to do essentially is to, to change the viscous term Okay, this is not for the Navier-Stokes equation, this is for a simple dynamical model, which is called the shell model, but as the same quantity, okay, you see from, from uh, for this argument, it's very similar to the Navier-Stokes equation. So the idea is to replace the viscous term, which breaks the time symmetry, with a, with a term, different term, which is symmetric in a time reversal. It is, can, this can be done, the original proposal was done by Galavotti many years ago, you have to, to introduce a dynamical viscosity which change with the field, and you have to keep some, to, to, to force the preservation of some quantity. For example, we, we preserve the estrophy. So we studied this problem in the shell model. And the result, okay, let me skip all this stuff. The result is, is interesting. The result is that irreversible shell model, reversible Navier-Stokes, if you want, you have that the Grandjean trajectory, the power along the Grandjean trajectory is still time irreversible. So there is not a direct link between the, 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 the equation, the reversibility of the equation and the reversibility of the, the trajectories. Okay, you can see here, this is for the reversible system. This is the third order moment of the power. They are negative. 
they scale with the Reynolds number, as in the normal Navier-Stokes equation, but the scaling exponents are different. They should lie represent the scaling that we observe in the Navier-Stokes equation. Here, the scaling exponents are different, but okay, there is no reason to have a universality. universality we are using a different system here, okay? So we are really changing the physics. Um, okay. Uh, okay, this is, the end of, this is the end of my talk. Uh, we have seen that uh, <clears throat> we have a signature of reversibility in the energy fluctuation along the Lagrangian trajectory, thanks to the flight crash event. We have seen the dependency on the Reynolds number and the agreement with the multifractal model. Uh, I didn't mention, but we also studied this, this problem in other systems, for example, in two-dimensional turbulence. So you can also study in, uh, different turbulence systems like MHD. And we also studied a little bit in preliminary study in shell model, Lagrangian reversibility in the reversible Navier Stokes equation. Apart from the theoretical interest of this problem, I want to mention the fact that this is, <coughs> can be, have some relevance for uh, Lagrangian models. So there are several models, for example, models for dispersion of pollutants in the atmosphere or in the ocean, which are not based on the Navier Stokes equation because you cannot simulate all the, the field is too big. So you use a kind of stochastic model to describe how the particle moves in your flow. And these stochastic models do not take, take into account so far the irreversibility along the Lagrangian trajectory. So using this result can be an improvement in developing Lagrangian dispersion model, Lagrangian model for dispersion. Uh, so with that, thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. And if you want to have more details about the result, you can have a look at this paper. Okay, arigato. Thank you very much for the talk and also for the nice uh, review of basic turbulence. <laughs> so let's see if there is any question from the audience. The the starting from, yeah, the internet and Mahesh. I have the follow-up from Mahesh Pandi yeah. from online. So he says, thank you, Guido. I understand my observation was in line with what you explained later in the talk. I wish I had had the patience to wait. Another question. Can you offer any thoughts or comments on how this picture changes for 2, 2D turbulence? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maesh. Uh, so to the turbulence, I don't have the, I don't think I have the slides here. We study also two-dimensional turbulence. And what is remarkable is that uh, we expect uh, since the two-dimensional turbulence, I don't know if you, if you know two-dimensional turbulence, but the, the main point is that in two-dimensional turbulence, the energy flow from small scale to large scale, okay? Because of several reasons, the conservation of entropy is the main reason. And so we expect that since uh, here, let me go to the, uh, okay, this one. Since the power, okay, is proportional to minus epsilon to some power, the third moment is proportional to epsilon cube times uh, the constant and the Reynolds number, we expect that in two-dimensional term that we have to have the opposite asymmetry. But this is not the case. This is somehow surprising that uh, uh, in two-dimensional turbulence, we have very similar result at the level of the statistic of the power in spite of the fact that the flux is opposite, is from small scale to large scale. Then the details are different, are very different. For example, the different contribution, okay, that we have here in the two-dimensional turbulence are different. There are different contribution of the different terms. But the main point is that uh, the skewness of the power is negative, is, uh, is invariant with the dimensionality, which is somehow surprising, but I don't know why. Thank you very much. Uh, what happens with entropy in this like time and turbulent developed flow? Like, is this to continue to grow or what happens? The entropy. Hmm? What happened in which sense? Uh, like, can you apply those model like for entropy calculation or like? I, I'm not sure I understood the, the uh, question. You, you mentioned the, the entropy or? Entropy, the, entropy. Ah, the entropy yeah. in the system. Which sense the entropy, the microscopic or I don't? Okay, uh, this is a microscopic system. So I, I have no, no access to a microscopic uh, entropy here. You can define some kind of entropy in the turbulent flow. But uh, uh, also I don't, I don't know very well the result about the entropy. I'm sorry for, for, for this. But microscopic entropy. Yeah. 
Yeah, entropy is similar, but it's a different, completely different quantity. Yes. Wait, wait, sorry. <coughs> uh, what happens to this Lagrangian irreversibility in uh, like oil oiler flows? If we have a turbulent oiler, oiler flow? In oiler flow? Yeah. Oh, this is a very good question. I don't know. Uh, so in oiler flow, you know that oiler, I think you observe the, okay. The problem is that the Euler, the solution of Euler, which develop, typically develop, uh, develop singularity. No? And, uh, but the fact that they can develop singularity, for example, makes that the, the Euler equation, which formally conserves the energy, can also dissipate energy, okay? In a weak sense, you have a weak solution of the Euler equation, which dissipate energy in a finite. Uh, so I don't no idea what happened for Lagrangian trajectory. The problem is that doing simulation with, uh, to compute the Lagrangian trajectory, you need to do simulation, you cannot do anything else. And doing simulation with the Euler equation for sufficiently long time in order to see dissipation, I don't know the statistics, sorry, of the Lagrangian tracer, I don't know if you can do that. But I would expect that you serve the same, the same feature. I mean, the same, because the dynamics, Euler equation, you have, there are some work on Euler equation uh, in the truncating navier stokes equation, or probably you know from the French group. And they observe a cascade like a navier stokes equation, in the, even if they do not have any viscosity, the flow starts to generate turbulence and you have a direct cascade. And then at a certain point, the energy starts to accumulate at a very small scale. And this is the signature to the formation of, of a singularity. Then the singularity is regularized by the fact that you have a finite resolution, but in principle you get a singularity. But in the, in, the, in the intermediate time, which you have a flow of energy, I would expect that the phenomenology that you observe is would be the same as in Navier Stokes. And is it because uh, the pressure term is the major contributor in that? Exactly. Period? This is one reason, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Because viscosity do not play any role here. Thank you for the talk. Um, so, uh, in your reversible shell model, so even though the I, what I understood is even though the model was designed to be reversible, it showed irreversibility. So, is it not? So how does the forcing there affect okay, the formulation exactly. of the forcing would can Great. affect that, no? Great. Yeah, so the, the shell model is designed, so uh, here is not very clear, but the point is that it's time reversible because this, this quantity is U over T, so it doesn't change sign, okay? U goes minus U and T minus T. This is U squared, doesn't change sign. And the, 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 the dynamical viscosity is built in a way that this is proportional to u, and if I remember, this is proportional to u to the power three, and then it's multiplied by u, so this is uh, symmetric also, so it doesn't change sign. So formally, it's time reversible, right? But the point is that the dynamics is very, is, is, uh, very far from an equilibrium, because you have the forcing, which is a large scale, and then you force the system to dissipate a small scale. This is a very delicate technical point, and the way you force the system to dissipate a small scale is not by adjusting the viscosity because you have no control of the viscosity, but you ask to have a finite, a given entropy. So you, this, this quantity is designed in the way that you preserve the entropy in the system. In this, case, in this way, you have a scale separation between the, the forcing scale and the dissipative scale. Why the entropy? Because the entropy is a small scale quantity. We first try, with the viscosity where fix the, the total energy in the system, and this doesn't work, do not produce any turbulence because everything is a large scale, you don't have an energy. So you have, a, a, you have an irreversible, irreversible dynamics at the end because of the, the, the separation between the injection of the energy and the, and the dissipation of the energy. This is what makes the, the system dissipative. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there is one more question from the internet. Yeah, I have another one from the chat from Amal. How does the Lagrangian irreversibility differ from the Euler irreversibility? Huh. Uh, yes. The difference is that in the Euler irreversibility is based on the structural function uh, or the of his law or structural function, which is two point correlator. So two point statistics in two different points. If you look, uh, the distribution of the velocity in a single point everywhere in the field, so the Eulerian 
the Eulerian statistic, you get something which is Gaussian perfectly symmetric. You don't see any signature irreversibility. You need two point quantities. Why the Lagrangian statistics is uh, irreversibility along a single trajectory. So a single point statistic at different time. This is the difference. Okay, thank you. Hello, I was, I was surprised by the histogram of the viscous term, how it sometimes injects energy into the yeah. flow. Yeah. Because I thought the viscous term was always taking energy from the flow. Like in, in Fourier space, uh, this term just becomes k squared times u squared, which is always positive. Uh, no, no, this is not true. In a Fourier space, is the average that becomes u k square u square. Okay, in order to make this term u square t square, you have to to be to to make an integration by part. This can be done only on the average. So you have to take the average, and then one of the two double goes on the other side, and so you have double u square. And this is definitely positive. But this term is. There is no reason why this must be negative or positive, you see. Indeed, it's positive in the plus, while it's negative. So, the, that is it. so locally, the dissipation can absorb energy locally. But the average, of course, is negative. And you see here, PDF. OK. Thanks. Thank you for the question. It's very OK, so is there any other question? So it's thanks to speaking again. Thank you very much.